Welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast, the official podcast of Ryan Johnson Ministries. This podcast was created for the purpose of equipping others for the advancement of the kingdom of God. We hope that you enjoy this episode and encourage you to subscribe to the Blacksmith Chronicles today. For more information about Ryan Johnson Ministries, please visit www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Filled Tuesday night. That's right. We are going to bring your faith to higher realms. It is going to get you ignited and excited for the things that God has placed inside of you. Because I really believe, I truly believe that the best is yet to come. I really, um, I, I love my guest today. I think he is so awesome. And it's it's something that's really interesting because he got this uh, understanding about, um, about when we get a promise, when God gives us a, a prophetic promise that, that there is something that we have to do as the body. We have to come into agreement with it and we have to press into it in order for us to see the things that God actually has planned for us. You know, that's why he gives us these glimpses and little bits and pieces, because what he's saying is that this is what I want to do. This is what I've called you to do. And this is what I'm planning on doing. Are you going to partner with me? You see, there is something we have to do. The, The thing about a prophetic word, and I really feel strongly about this, is that a prophetic word is it's a promise. But it's also something that's been established. And this is something that the Lord just dropped on me recently. And he said, he said, Lisa, he said that um, when you are seeing something prophetically or you see something in the future, he says, it's not just a hope for maybe I'm kind of like a genie in a bottle wishing for it. No, this is something that's done and established. And so prophetically, what you're doing is you're going into your future, you're grabbing hold of it, and you're pulling it into your present. See, when when if you think about with Jesus, everything that he said, he fulfilled all the prophetic words because he always was, he was always um, taken to the cross. The, the cross always happened. That's how the, the different prophets were able to talk about it because it was a done deal. It was already established. It was before the foundations of time. So we can't prophetically see, uh, say something and see something that God is saying. And that's the other thing. We have to understand if it's what God is saying. We know that it's God. We're, we're seeing something he's already said yes to. He's already said, this is what I'm planning on doing. But now I want you to take that promise and I want you to pull it into your future and hold on to it and start walking into it. It's like he's giving us a recipe for a, a fantastic cake and he's showing us what it's going to look like. But there still is something we have to do. We have to use the necessary ingredients to make that thing happen. And that's exactly what happened with my guest. My guest was, well, first of all, my guest, here it is, Ryan Johnson. It's how to contend for a miracle. And um, he, he's been on my show. He was on my show last year and he is so fantastic. But what I loved about this book is that he was able to take little glimpses. He was able to take dreams. He was able to take the promises that God had, and he was able to hold on to them during the most difficult time in his life. And he was able to see it get fulfilled. Do you want to know how that happened? Well, we're going to talk to Ryan and he's going to tell us exactly how that happened. So without further ado, I would like to bring up Ryan Johnson. He's from Ryan Johnson's Ministries. He is so fantastic. He has a a podcast called The Blacksmith Chronicles, which you guys can go and find out. It's actually um, now on Destiny. Is that correct, Ryan? Yes, ma'am. And I think that it's, um, it's so cool. What, what God is doing, because even the last time that you were here, we were talking about how God was about to just start moving and shaking things and was, and I think you were in the process of writing the book. The book was, uh, you were writing the book back in uh, 2019. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. It, it's been a, it's been a, it was actually a two year journey to see it fulfilled. So uh, it was released in February of 2020. So 
Yeah, I was definitely in the process. That is so cool. All right. So let's talk a little bit about this. Let's talk about how you were able to see God. Okay. So we don't want to give too much away because the book, the book has some really great practical applications in it, especially because I really believe that God is really working on faith. Look at where we are right now. Hello. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, seriously, like we have to start speaking out these things because I don't know, Ryan, you have promises, right? To have bigger conferences. God's God's shown you that, right? He's he's shown you that you're going to be doing some, some big things. Yes. Yes. I I mean, every individual may not always recognize that there are prophetic words from God over your life. But even though you do not recognize them, it does not mean that those words are not there. Mm. In certain applications, there are things that we personally have recognized in our own life. And, you know, they've came through dreams. They've came through open visions. They've came through prophetic words of other individuals. And those are things that you hold on to. But the difficulty is in life, sometimes we're throwing those curveballs. We're throwing those obstacles. You know, uh, we were going to be doing an event in March this year, and then the nation goes on to a lockdown and states and stuff. So we have to postpone that. Now, that's a good example of something that we were going to host. Does it mean that that thing? is no longer possible does it mean that it shouldn't happen it doesn't uh you know you have this obstacle happen in life and you know there's this curveball in this it doesn't necessarily mean that the dream the vision or the promise is derailed and denied it simply means that sometimes you have to contend for something to be fulfilled and through that contending you're fighting for this fulfillment And the enemy wants to do whatever the enemy can to try to ultimately deny the prophetic promises of God. Just as we've heard preachers say, and we know this, the enemy knows the word of God. Well, the enemy also hears a lot of those prophetic promises. You have someone that releases a prophetic word over your life. Demonic spirits heard that. So they're going to do what they can to try to derail that. But we have to be willing to fight for the fulfillment of those promises. Things in our life that seem trivial, sometimes we just walk away from. But when life gets hard and life gets very challenging and difficult, such as the reason that this book came to existence um, was really something that the Lord took me through concerning my own mother. Um, And in this process, we have to understand that there's going to be times in our life that we will have that fight. We will have that grit. We will have that stamina to be able to wage warfare through prayer, through uh, prophesying, and so on and so forth. But there's times in our lives that we find ourselves very weak. We find ourselves beaten down, uh, unable or unable to pray, to seek things through and contend. And that's one of the things about the beauty of the body of Christ. We have brethren that we can call upon that knows how to agree with us. And this was one of those things in my mother's case. Many years ago, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. And before she was diagnosed with cancer, I honest to goodness, I would have defined myself as the faith guy. I would have said, hands down, you know, I'm the faith guy. I'm, I'm the guy that understands faith, walks in faith, takes these great leaps of faith, have all these radical stories of radical faith and such and everything. And people would say to me that, you know, they would say, you got radical faith. And I would always correct them because I would say there's no such as radical faith. Radical faith seems like a possibility, but at the end of the day, all that it is is obedience, obedience to what God is calling you to do, what God is saying. When you find yourself obedient, it appears to be radical faith because it goes against our flesh. So in January of this particular year, I was visiting my parents and uh, the first Sunday of the year and in the middle of worship, the Lord speaks to me and says, what you think you know about faith is nothing. And I remember I was standing up and I remember just kind of kind of slouching down in the chair and I was like, 
um, surely you're not talking to me. <laughs> you know, I'm the faith guy. What are you what are you talking about here? And in the midst of that, the Lord starts breaking down some things and he takes me on this journey. So January, February, March, I'm in the state of Virginia. I'm running, uh, I'm being a part of a conference there. And I get the phone call from my mother that says she's been diagnosed with cancer. The type of cancer that she had, uh, she'd have immediate surgery. And she had to have a double mastectomy, all this stuff and everything. She's crying. She's upset. And all I can think in that moment is all of a sudden I get hit with something that had happened to my mother's life about 15 years prior to that. And my mother, 15 years prior to that, she was having these dreams every night for two weeks. Same dream every single night. She'd call me the next day and she said, I had the dream again. I had the dream again. And this dream was her, and she was an older woman. She had gray hair, and uh, she was playing with grown grandkids. So when my mother calls me and tells me that she has cancer, I get overwhelmed with this wave of remembrance about these prophetic dreams that my mother had. And all of a sudden, I realized that the three months prior to that, when God had really started wrecking my theology about faith and prophetic words, promises, and dreams, that God had been preparing me for this. He was teaching me how to contend before I would ever have to contend. So my mother's on the phone and I say, okay, it's okay to cry. It's okay to hurt in this moment. It's, you know, it's devastating news when you hear that from a doctor. Go through the motion. It's fine. And I specifically said to my mother, I said, I have a word from the Lord you will live and not die. And so I, we, we came home, we, we went to the surgery for my mother, I got my family together and I said, look, <clears throat> my siblings, my dad. And I said, I have a word from the Lord. Mom is going to live and she's not going to die. I, I need you to understand something. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to be overwhelmed with my emotions with mom. I'm going to be strong. I can't let mom see me cry. I need to be strong for my mother. And I said, don't, don't think I'm a jerk or I'm insensitive to what is happening. I'm just telling you, I have a word from the Lord and I need to be confident in this war in this word. So time goes on. I had eventually had, uh, renamed it. I would not utter the word cancer. I actually renamed it C A N apostrophe T C E R. And every time I would say it, I would say can't sir can't sir i am my mother's oldest son and i would say i have a birthright over my mother's life and i would i would in my prayer in my confession everything i was saying i was saying can't sir because in my mind in my words i was saying i never said it could so i was exercising a birthright so this was months of this you know going on that this is happening and in that process uh, we had visited my mother. I lived away and um, we had some, we had a friend with us. We're, we're sitting in the living room and my mother just, she just snaps. It's the best way that I can say it. She just absolutely snaps. And she calls for me in the bedroom. Now I have not seen my mother without hair. Uh, I, she'd always wore this um, head wrap thing. I'd not seen it. I had not cried, not one single time, uh, in front of my mother. Now, I had cried, but not in front of my mother. And she calls me in the bedroom. And <laughs> as I'm going in the bedroom, all I can think is, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. Because, you know, I'm trying to be this picture of faith for my mother. And she pulls her headscarf off. And you have to understand, my mother is a five foot two Southern Belle who the best way I can say this, she looks like Dolly Parton. And when we've been, pu we've been in public, people have thought she actually was Dolly Parton. And I may have had some fun with that in public sometimes. But nevertheless, she pulls her uh, head wrap off. There's her bald head. She's sitting on her bed. She calls me to her and she lays her head on my shoulder right here. And uh, she's crying. And she says, I, I can't do this anymore. 
I just, I cannot do this anymore. And she said, I'm so tired. I'm so sick. I just want to die. I just want to die. And then she said, pray that I will die. And at first, you know, when you hear anyone that you're close to say things like that, you know, you're just, you're kind of emotionally ripped apart. But it did something to me. It, 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 it kind of alerted me to the situation. And so I pushed my mother back. I looked at my mother and I said, I need you to hear me as a man of God and not so much as your little boy, your son. I need you to hear me as a man of God. And up to this point, I had still never reminded her of those dreams that she had all those years prior to that. Never said a word. Never actually said a word to my dad, my siblings. Only person that knew was my wife. And I had just I'd sat on that. So I knew that the enemy was trying to prematurely take my mother out. But I was having a fight for her life because she had become spiritually, mentally, physically, she had become weak. And I, I kind of pushed her back and I said that. And I did kind of talk a little hard. Uh, I was trying to snap her out of it. And I said, you are going to live and not die, but I, I need you to do me a favor. And I said, if you will give me 40 days to pray and fast for you, if you'll give me that time to fight for your life after the 40 days is up, after I've prayed and I've fasted and you want to die, I will pray you into heaven. Now, I didn't mean that in terms of Catholicism. I meant that in we would pray that she would be taken on by the Lord. So she looked at me and she said, OK. So I just went to praying and, and, and contending every single day. I fasted. I prayed. I worshiped. You know, I did this for 40 days. On day 40, cannot make this up. On day 40, my phone rings. It's my mother. And she says, first words out of her mouth. She says, Ryan, I have grown grandkids to play with. Now, you have to understand something. At that time, the oldest grandchild was 16 years old. And some of the grandkids weren't even born yet. Now, the oldest grandchild today actually turned 23, and the youngest is two. So it's nowhere near the fulfillment of the promise. But here's the point. I never reminded her of those dreams. Dad didn't know about the dreams that, that I was praying about siblings didn't know god renewed her mind and remembered the dream the prophetic promises over her and she said i want to live so you fast forward to where we're at today my mother's still alive she's cancer free she fought i fought this is this is how this thing all comes to the existence of this book to understand is there are times in our lives that the enemy is going to try its best to derail the prophetic promises. But you and I have the ability to know and learn how to contend for the miracle that we need. It's such a beautiful, beautiful story. Okay, there's so many things I want to kind of nail. So the the first thing that really uh, shook me, and I, and you and I were kind of talking before we we came on because um, I haven't had a chance to to talk to you prior to um, the show. I actually went through a similar circumstance with my mother being in a life or death situation when she was in a house fire. And one of the things that I really felt was I couldn't be weak. I couldn't let doubt. That was what I felt is that I couldn't bring in, I, I couldn't bring in negativity because I had, in that point of my walk, I, well, I wasn't walking, but <laughs> at that point of my life, you know, I didn't understand anything about the prophetic. I didn't understand anything about anything, but I just knew because God was talking to me during that time. And he, he said, you know, if you're having a bad day, don't bring in that negativity. And if we look into scripture, when the little girl died, 
And Jesus went to the house and the little girl died and all of the mourners were there. Then what happened is Jesus told all the mourners, leave, <laughs> because he couldn't let that doubt. He had to keep the, the, the faith, because that's the whole thing. It's what are we agreeing with? And so in this, in this beautiful exchange where you have to separate yourself from being a son, this is so beautiful because you said, mom, I need you to look at me. You need to look at me, not as your son. You need to look at me as a man of God, as a mouthpiece of God, as someone who is here to decree and declare that you will live. So you had to pull up your authority and you had to look at your mother who is so weak and so terrified, but yet so comforted by death. So comforted because I think sometimes we can, the enemy just can say, but, oh, but then you be with Jesus and you don't have to be sad anymore and you don't have to be throwing up anymore. And, you know, I know that especially for a woman to lose her hair, you know, and to lose her, to lose, cause she had a double mastectomy to, to lose her womanness, you know, like to lose her breast was, it's devastating. It's, it, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. That's how ugly cancer is. I hate it. And so, but yet God was able to give you those promises and to stir up the faith inside of you, Ryan, so that you were able, it's just like, you know, sometimes it's like where, where you were weak, I am strong. You know, God was like, okay, Ryan, you're going to be her strength because she needs something tangible. She needs something she could feel. She needs something she could lean on. And so, and you also challenged her. <laughs> you said, I'm going to meet you where you are but give me 40 days. And in those 40 days, Jesus took her into the wilderness and he reminded her of her promises. And he spoke to her because now she came out of agreement with what the enemy was doing. And she said, okay, God, I'm gonna give you 40 days. And so there was this beautiful exchange that happened, but, the, but that's the power of our words because you never agreed with it. You even changed Come on, you changed the name. <laughs> now think about this. You took something that said cancer. Yes, cancer, you can take her and said, uh, I'm sorry, sir, you can't, sir. You can't, sir. You changed its name. There's something very prophetic, Ryan, in what you did even though you didn't understand like at that moment, but you were like, no, you can't have her cancer. You can't, you know? And there was this, this uh, lion that rose up and said, absolutely not. But as you, as your faith, and that was the other thing too, it, when the Lord said <laughs> that you don't understand faith, right? <laughs> like, think about it. We, we really don't. Because when your mother was on the altar, like Isaac, when your mother was on the altar, God had something in the thicket for her. He had something in the thicket that wasn't going to take her, but there was going to be an exchange. That there was something that God already did. Jesus already did. He was in the thicket and he was caught and he was going to come out and he was going to show her that that blood still works. That blood is still powerful. That blood still applies. And I really believe that that your book, Contending, Contend, How to Contend for a Miracle, is so important, especially um, who, for, for you guys who are listening, for the people who um, are having a hard time with their faith. I mean, what are some of the, the things that you've heard, Ryan? What are some of the testimonies that have come? Because I'm sure there's been tons and tons of testimonies that have come out of this. You know, one of the things that um, surprised me uh, after the book, you know, was published and stuff and everything, I had an individual that said, you know, what I appreciate about your book more than anything is the realness of it. And I said, well, what do you mean about that specifically? And they said, to be honest with you, the minute I saw how to, it kind of put me off. And they said, the reason is I can't tell you how many how-to books by Christian <laughs> authors I've mm -hmm. read mm -hmm. that 
they write how to, but they themselves have never endured it. They've never went through it. They've never walked through the trial, the tribulation. They've never done all these things. And, and they said, that was the thing that I, I appreciate the most is you're not telling me how to do something without you yourself doing it, not taking these applications. Now, I want to stop here because there's a lot of people that would jump in and say, well, this was your mother going through cancer. It's easy for you to believe for someone versus you yourself. And I understand that. I, I definitely get that. But I, I want to reiterate something about the importance of one another in the body of Christ. Granted, we're in the midst of this pandemic, which has caused a lot of frustrations, inconveniences, and so on and so forth. But it has really truly reveal, revealed two things. Number one, I think it's revealed that people genuinely need people. Genuinely. God didn't create mankind to be alone. We know this in the beginning of the scripture. The second part of that is it's revealed a spirit of, of division within the body of Christ to tear one another down. And I think that is extremely heartbreaking and sad because I've had these individuals that, that have commented back from the book and they said, you know, if it wasn't for my brother or my husband or my mother, if it wasn't for this. And the one thing that is kind of just overwhelmed me about the response of the book is not necessarily, quote unquote, the personal stories. It's been the stories of had it not been for someone who fought with me. And that's what has taken me off guard. I, I anticipated hearing the, the personal stories, but I've heard more stories that the person said, this individual was that for me. And it's really alerted me to the importance of who we are as sons and daughters of God, how we're supposed to help. Every man, according to the scriptures, given a measure of faith. Well, according to scripture, when you study that out, that measure of faith is, is a teeny tiny measure of faith. And in, in it's put into the creation of mankind that we would one day, through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that we would receive him, that faith to believe in the Son of God. But then life happens and you lose the job. You lose the home. You, you have a prodigal son or a daughter. You go through a divorce. You, you know, whatever the case may be. And life is hard. And there are times when we are physically exhausted. We are tired. We are mentally fatigued, spiritually drained. And there's times that when we know that we should be praying, but we don't feel like praying. There's times when our faith should be increased, but our faith is nowhere where it should be. There's two things that is beautiful about understanding how Scripture works. Number one is 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that there are nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit has nine gifts. We love the gift of tongues, the interpretation of tongues. We love prophecy. Man, we love to talk about these things. What we seldom ever talk about is one of those nine gifts is the gift of faith. That's right. You and I in our life will need a baptism of faith. Now, I'm not saying that when you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, you didn't get it. What I'm saying is you need a refilling, a renewal of faith in your life. When your faith becomes so limited and weak, you can seek the Lord to have a fresh baptism of faith. And out of that, you have a supernatural and dwell in spirit that increases the faith of the moment that you need. The other application of that is people, those that can pray with you, those that can contend. And that's what really is the most, it, it, it's one of the most surprising things for me. Um, but I, I don't know why I was surprised because look at the scripture. We admire Simon Peter. Man, Simon Peter, he was he was willing to jump out of the boat. He was willing to cut the ear off. He was willing to do that. But look at the relationship he had with John the Beloved. A lot of what Simon Peter did in the Gospels, he wouldn't have done it without John the Beloved. And then when you look at the Scripture and you go forward, you have Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Silas, Paul and Timothy. 
And you, you see this beautiful picture of how God has individuals that will co-labor and join and help one another in this process. So that was the thing that shocked me about the feedback that I'm getting from people is they're saying, this is what this person helped me do. This person rose up. This person done that. Now, I said all that. Ultimately, to say there's one part of the book where everybody kind of comes back and go, you wrecked my theology on faith. Every I, it, It's kind of the aha moment when people realize what they define as faith is often not really faith. It's often something that we see, therefore we define it as faith and we believe it. So what the book has done is it's peeled back an understanding of faith, an understanding of what faith actually is, what it actually looks like, how we walk in faith, how faith has to co-labor with trust. And out of that, you also have, of course, hope, but then how you connect those things with prophetic words. I've gotten a lot of emails and messages from people about prophetic words. You know, when the book first came out, I got a lot right there in the beginning of people were saying, you know, I have this prophetic word I've yet to see fulfilled. Do you think that that there's a possibility of it? And I always remind those individuals that the beauty of God's prophetic word is if God said it, that settles it. Our hang up is whether or not we see it. We have a tendency as people to kind of clarify whether or not it is a fulfilled prophetic word based on whether or not we see it. And what I mean by that is because I, I want to bring a realistic side of this. Had my mother died, I do genuinely believe that the enemy was trying to prematurely take her out. And that's why we fought for her life. Now, the reality is my mom will one day die. Everyone is appointed once unto death to die. There will be a day that she steps into eternity. We all know that. But let's say that she has a prophetic dream, revision, or word, and she doesn't live to see that word. Does it mean that that word wasn't fulfilled? And that's where we all hurt, and that's where we all trouble. We get troubled at times because you think of the older mother who has a prophetic word over a son or a daughter that is bound by drugs and addiction. That word is they're going to serve the Lord. That mother lives to be 85 years old, but their child still bound by drugs and addiction. 85 years old, she steps into eternity. Ten years later, that child surrenders their life to the Lord, becomes born again, and serves the Lord. The beauty in that is, of course, God was not a liar because he can't lie. The word came true. The difficulty is we all want to see it happen. Mm, yes. But I show you in scripture how God often gives you the glimpses of those prophetic words to show you the end of the story to get us to live out the rest of the story. That's the beautiful thing about even the feedback I've gotten from people is where they have told so-and-so stepped into eternity, but this word came to fulfill. Right. And that to me is the most exciting thing is we all want to see it. I get it. We all do. But it was fulfilled and that should encourage us. Well, if you if you think about it, when we step into eternity, then we get to see everything like we get to see everything. Like my dad stepped into eternity in January and um, and I had this vision um, while I was in worship. I, I had this vision and I saw my dad with Jesus. And the Lord started talking to me and he said to me, he said, Lisa, he, he now knows everything. He knows everything. He knows everything about his life. He knows where things didn't happen. He understands. But it, what, what was really interesting is that the Lord started to talk to me and he started to say that, you know, that it says we have a great cloud of witnesses on the other side. And that's, that's scriptural, Right. But we, we tend to believe that the great cloud of witnesses are, uh, you know, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and, and Noah. And, uh, we think of the great cloud of witnesses as, as the, the ones in the Bible. But what the Lord really has really put on my heart is he said, Lisa, he says, the great cloud of witnesses are the people who also love you. 
if they are with me, they are part of the witnesses. And what does the witness, what do they do? They pray for us. They see and they contend. Ah, that's so good. They contend for us on the other side. So the contending never stops, you know, but now it, if it says that we have more for us than against us, you know, we have a great cloud of witnesses that are for us who are contending for our future, who now see it. So like as if we have parents on the other side, especially like a father, my, the Lord said to me, he says, Lisa, he says, your father has seen your future and he is now praying for you. So now you have a father's blessing a heaven, from a heavenly perspective, because now my father knows all the plans and the purposes that God has for me. And so there's this beautiful thing where they're now cheering us on to finish our race, but now they're also coming into agreement with it. So I believe like, just like with David, you know, David said that he wanted to build the temple, but the Lord said that he couldn't. And so he kept that promise. So sometimes the promise is so big that we can't fulfill it. And so sometimes we have to see our, our children. But I love what you said, that if God said that he's going to do it, he's going to do it. And I, you know, it's interesting because we don't understand like our ways are not his ways and his purposes. And we know all that. But there's also sometimes where we see something and I just kind of feel like we're seeing it. Where do we miss it? How do we go back? Because you know what? Abraham was shown. Now, did he see all of the descendants? No, but he did get his son, the promise. He did get to see his promise. So that's the other thing too. What, if, what is God showing us in the promise so that we can contend for it? You know, for you, you, you got to see with your mom, you saw that you saw a future. So you knew that that was a promise. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like the, uh, man's greatest hindrance <laughs> is in and of itself, man. Heck yeah. uh, <laughs> okay. Let's stop for one second. Let's say that again. Shall we? Man's greatest hindrance uh, is in and of itself man. Yes. And we love to blame the devil mm -hmm. and demonic spirits and all that. And I, I'm not discrediting that mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. There are times it's definitely the enemy. There's mm -hmm. times that it's definitely demonic spirit, oppression, whatever the case may be. But one of the, the most challenging things for any individual, I being chief among them all, is to get out of the way. Mm -hmm. I can see something and try to bring my own interpretation into it in order to make it fit my best need or circumstance and situation. It, And I believe it's why, this is my opinion, no one has to agree with me on that, but it's why we only get a certain glimpse of things. Mm -hmm. God doesn't necessarily show us the whole picture because many years ago I was in, uh, I was actually, I was with a spiritual father in Arlington national cemetery and I was really frustrated and I was kind of just, you know, pitching a little pity party. We're walking around and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm showing him all this stuff and everything. And here we are in DC and, and I, I'm just so mad. And I said, I don't understand how God can show me so much about someone else's future, but I can't see my hand in front of me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he looked at me and he said, before you answer, I really want you to think about this. And I said, okay. He said, if God showed you what you were going to do in June of next year, and this was many years ago, he said, what would you do? Mm. And so I, I really, I thought about it. We walked around. I mean, hours passed by. I genuinely thought, what would I do if God showed mm -hmm. me everything that was going to happen all the way up right. to June of next year? Right, right. And when he's, when I, Realized what I'd done. I said, okay, I have an answer. And he goes, what is it? And I said, I would sit down and do absolutely nothing so that I wouldn't mess it up. 
<laughs> I would not want to mess this up. So I would do nothing because I wouldn't want to get in the way. And then he looked at me and he said, exactly. that's why God won't show you. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I, it, it's, I one of these, it's one of these moments where you go, oh, <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> well, we get we get in the way. We do. And, you know, the other thing, too, is that sometimes, you know, we have other people, you know, I, I have, you know, spirit, I have a spiritual father who's watching today. And, you know, he said, Lisa, God showed me what you were going to do and who you were called to be. But I couldn't tell you because you wouldn't you wouldn't. <laughs> what did he say? He said you wouldn't have been ready for it or you would have been scared about it because, you know, sometimes the things that God has called us to do like you said, he'll give us just a, a glimmer or, or just a glimpse of it because it's overwhelming. Like, I mean, think about it. If you were, well, let's just say Billy Graham, like if God gave Billy Graham what he was going to do, that would have scared the heck out of him. But, you know, but there are other people who will come alongside us who will speak those moments into our life and say, I see you doing this and God will only give bits and pieces to other people. Nobody knows our full destiny. Like people have said to me, they said, oh my gosh, Lisa, the things I see for you. I'm like, well, what do you see? And they're like, I can't tell you. I'm like, all right, fine. <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay. But when you, when you hear that, it's like, oh, there's more. See, that's what I get out of it. I go, oh good, there's more. Because if we, if we went to a never ending buffet to go and get food and we had our plate and they said, up. Oh, nothing else. That's it. That was it. That would be it. Like game over, shut the restaurant, close the door. You get nothing, go home. You know, you lose good day, sir. That kind of thing. You know, but when we understand that the plans and the purposes that God has, you know, every single day, he has something for us and he will send messengers. He will send people. He will give us a scripture. He'll give us a dream. He'll talk to us. You know, he's always going to do something. And when it comes to a point where we're not getting anything, then we have to ask two questions. Have I gotten off my track? Because the path that I'm going has, there is nothing that's coming from God because I've gotten off on my own, doing my own thing. Or it, it, is it that I'm, that this is just finished? Do you know what I mean? Like, because I, I believe that God always has, it says, I have a, I have plans for you, says the Lord, right? Yes, absolutely. I, I think for a lot of Christians, American Christians, let me specify this, American Christians, we live such a Genesis slash Revelation life. We know enough about God in the beginning and enough about him in the end, but we really don't know the middle part of what really makes him who he is. I love that. I love that. That's so good, Ryan. That's we so try, good. We try to implement that in our life into where we, we know him as creator and we know him as, you know, eternal judge in that sense. But when we try to make that our understanding of God, we then try to implement that in our life. And that's how we live our life. We live our life in that same revelation, Genesis and Revelation. That's how we live our life. What God is calling us to is that middle part mm. to live that out. You know, here, yeah. here's the thing that I try to, I always ask this question a lot of times. We know that Jesus is crucified you know, around 33 years old. And so right. most people would say Jesus is crucified around AD 33. And that's kind of the understanding that we have. So I always say this question, when is Jesus crucified? I get that answer a lot of times mm -hmm. in that. I get the answer of the four gospels. The truth of the matter is Jesus was crucified before the foundations of the world. Come on, say that again. Heck yeah. And people don't they're, get they're, that. <laughs> no, so th what what we have to understand is God has always had the nature to show you the end of the story in order to get you to live out the rest of the story. Come Prophetic on. promises, dreams, and words often feel like 
the end of the story because what God is trying to get you and I to do is actually live it out. Mm -hmm. Well, how do we live it out? We live it out in faith. We live it out in trust. We live it out in hope. We live it out in relationship with love, with grace, with mercy. We live those things out. But because we only have the glimpse of Genesis and Revelation, we don't know how to live out with the hope, the faith, the trust, and, and so on and so forth. Because we we get these little bits and pieces of this stuff, but we don't really get the whole picture of it because we're just, in all honesty, there's a lot of American Christians. I'm, I'm specifying Americans. I can't speak for the rest of the world. I speak for some countries I've been into. But for American Christianity, our, our reality is we just want enough of God to get us to heaven. Oh, come on. Not enough to actually come contend on. for anything. Come on, say that one again. God, too. I would rather Shoot. you do the contending for me than for me to contend for anything. Mm. Th there's such a... Go ahead, say it. Well, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the, the <laughs> right word I'm trying to use here. There's such a lack of humility in the body of Christ to where... Mm -hmm. We're so driven by success. We're so driven by the American dream. Yep. We're so driven by the who's who that we don't really know how to fight for much. Mm. I I say yes to God. And so, God, you're supposed to give me everything that I have. You know, I you're supposed to have. I'm not supposed to be through having any suffering. I'm not supposed to be persecuted. Mm -hmm. I'm not supposed to go through these trials and tribulations. God, I said yes to you. I'm supposed to have the favor of God. now. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. I'm all for the favor of God. But we have preached the favor of God for so long that people don't know how to contend through the persecution, the trials and the tribulation in order to persevere. We're just seeking the favor. In other words, we're seeking the handout of the kingdom because we don't actually know how to build on solid ground. Come on. When we know how to build on solid ground, we know how to fight. Now, Everybody is trying to get in the lap of the Father, and I'm not against that. A true son of God knows when to sit in daddy's lap and to hear him whisper, I love you. Come on. But a true son of God also knows when it is time to get into the field and wield the sword Come on. and to wage warfare against principalities and powers and darkness of the air. The <laughs> truth of the matter is the scripture says the devil comes to steal kill and destroy we love to quote he come to give us life and give us life more abundantly yeah i get that yes he yep. has yep but you're going to recognize that will come with a price to pay come on and it's why so many christians don't know how to contend that's they don't it. know how to pray. They don't know how to see. They don't know how to fast. They don't know how to yearn. They don't know how to travail. As they the old timers to used to say, come on. Oh, that's a big one. Yeah. Huh. Repent. Are you kidding me? That's, Sorry. Now, we're know, going off on a whole new thing, but this is so good. So don't stop. <laughs> it's, it's the honest goodness truth. Mm -hmm. You can't contend for a miracle if you haven't even learned how to contend for your life. And what I mean by that is Paul said, I crucify myself daily. I yep. crucify my flesh. Yep. For what purpose? For what purpose? That I may pick up my cross and carry it. Mm -hmm. We have become so enamored that he took on the cross himself. We have convinced ourselves that there is not a cross that we have to bear. Oh no, trust me. And there's it, one. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's really earth shattering when you look at people and say, you still got to kill yourself. <laughs> You spirits are speaking. You oh, have got to get rid of this flesh. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to do this. You yeah. got to learn how to come out of that before you can do these other things. But yeah. these things are nasty. You know, they're, they're nothing there. It is the most odd thing in the Bible. When we really understand this, the most beautiful smell, the most beautiful aroma to the Lord is rotting spiritual flesh yep, sure that is, is burnt on the altar. That's it. When that is happening, we love to say fire, send your fire, Lord, send your <laughs> fire, fire, come down, fire, come down. We all, oh man, we say that all the time. <laughs> and they don't know what they mean. 
mean. They no, know but- not what they mean because he he's like, cool, let me burn you up. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want that kind of fire. I want the good fire. I want your fire. No, no, no. He is a consuming flame and he's going to burn up what needs to be burned up. It needs to be burned up because we can't go from glory to glory. Glory to glory means you've got to go into the fire. That means you got to burn a little bit. You got to die a lot. And then that way you can start to look a little bit more like Jesus because we got too much stuff. Oh my God. We got layers upon layers upon layers of clothing. And how are you going to get a tan if you're bundled up? You can't. You have to start taking off the stuff so that you can sit in the sun so that you can start getting a tan. You can't sit in the sun if you're bundled up. Can't do it. Sorry. Uh, No, I mean, here's the thing. We are building altars in this nation. Don't come don't, on. But, but the problem is we're bedazzling them. We're making them pretty. We're putting on our little trends and this and everything. Mm-hmm. Fire doesn't fall on the altar because the altar was built. That's right. The only time fire ever falls is when there's a sacrifice placed on the altar. Mm. We've not learned how to sacrifice ourselves. And that's the most beautiful thing about Abraham's story. Yep. God gives him this prophetic dream, this vision, this word, this release of you're going to have all these descendants. It's going to come through you and Sarah's child. And mm-hmm. then here's the child. <laughs> and, and we can debate age. And I know a lot of people, he's older, he's a teenager, he's this or that. I'm not going to get in debate with anybody. Yeah. I just know Abraham had a knife in his hand and yeah. Isaac was on the altar. Yeah. And here's the thing. God tells him to kill the prophetic word. And oh. that's where we're all checking out right there. Mm-hmm. That's it. I'm done. God, you, do <laughs> you know, how this, well, first of all, most Americans would say devil get behind me in the name mm-hmm. of Jesus, because mm-hmm. God would, God would never tell you to do that. That, that's oh. that's our favorite phrase right now. Right. God would never tell you to do these things. And the truth of the matter is, Abraham knew the voice of the father in such a way. That's right. All the other voices were not in comparison to the Come father's on. voice. Come on. It's why it's why it's so beautiful to Je- uh, in John 10 when Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. There's a lot of sheep that knows the sound but don't know the voice. And there's a difference between that because they can hear the sound of a hallelujah, but cannot hear the voice of the one decrying or decreeing the hallelujah from Mm, the throne. Come on. That's another thing. Nevertheless, Abraham has the knife. He's going to go through with it. There has to be something bigger than that because, and, and that's where we are all at. We have to understand in order to fulfill prophetic words and promises and contend for miracles and whatever it is that we're doing, we have really got to know the voice of the Father. That's right. The voice of the Son and voice of Holy Spirit. That's right. We, we're, we're too easily swayed by the voices of the population rather than the voice of the one. That's right. And, it, it, and it's one of these things that, it, it, and, and I'm not saying this to be arrogant, but I'm saying this is how your faith will often be measured. Because when you're in right relationship with the Lord, you will do things that will cause you to move on his voice. Here's what I mean. They're in the boat. The second time storm comes. Now, yep. to be honest with you, if I'd been me, I wouldn't even been in the boat the second time because I've been <laughs> like the first time we got chewed out. Right. The second time I feel like this is a trap. I'm being set up and he's up on the hill praying. He's not in the bottom of the boat sleeping. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, he comes walking out of the water. Jesus does. John the beloved says, hey, it's the Lord. Mm -hmm. And Simon Peter says, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. All Jesus says is come. We read this story and we go, oh, my gosh, look at Peter's life. Oh, he walked on water. How awesome. So beautiful. We even preach. He took his eyes off Jesus. He sank. He got his you know, hand. We've seen all the paintings. We've seen all that. I get all that. I'm not discrediting all that. Here's what I'm saying. Not one time in scripture can you ever see where Simon Peter was ever called to walk on the water. Mm. He wasn't called to walk on the water. Nope. He was called to walk on the word. I'm in the boat. The word said, come. He got out of the boat. Why did he get out of the boat? Because he said, even in the midst of the storm, he recognized the voice. Come on. My sheep know my voice. If you know anything about sheep, 
Why that is so important is no matter where the sheep are at, whenever they recognize the voice of the shepherd, they will forsake wherever they're at in the moment to go to the one that has the voice. Peter is in the storm about to die. That's what he thinks, but he gets out of the boat. Them 11 other turkeys remained in the boat, (laughs) but he got out of the boat because he walked on the word. What God is calling you and me to and everyone else is to learn how to walk on the word. That's right. Absolutely. And, you know, if we I I just want to go back to uh, to Abraham for one second, because when you when you're talking about contending, he said like when he went up and even when he went up to go do the sacrifice, he had full intentions of killing Isaac. He had full intentions. There was no question about it. But he said to his servants, stay here. The boy and I are going to do our sacrifice and then we will return. We will. He was already prophetically saying because he knew the promise. Because he said, if he dies, there is no stars in the sky. There is no sand on the floor. So even when we are confronted with something that doesn't look like it's possible that that this is going to derail my promise but see when when you're putting something on the altar when you're putting something on the altar that you love but you trust god more than what you love you will see god replace what you thought you were going to have to give up to give you increase so and that's going to be what, what what's happening right now with the church because get, let me tell you something, those churches are on the altar, boy. And I'm not saying, look, I'm not saying that I don't love the church. I love the church. I don't like what it's become because it's it's not, it, there's too many limitations for God moving. And so, you know, God didn't cause this, but God said, hey, I'm going to use this. And so what he's doing is he's doing a paradigm shift in our in our um, understanding of who he is. And he's saying that the Holy Spirit can be filled as you're listening to music in your house. You don't have to go to a building. How about that? That you can feel the presence of God being in your own home. Holy moly. That you can read the word of God in your own home. Hallelujah. And guess what? You can actually have church seven days a week rather than just on Sunday to make you feel good. How about that? And people are going to come back when they do open because it is going to open. But these churches who have been giving this feel good, I'm going to give you some more sugar to get you all like, oh man, I'm going to give you sugar. Just like a parent who who hypes up their kid on sugar and doesn't give them meat and doesn't give them nutrients. Guess what? When the sugar rush dies down, there's a big crash. And that's what we're experiencing. That's why the church is where it is. That's why if the church were where it was, it sh- where it should be before this coronavirus hit, guess what would have happened? We would have said, oh, coronavirus? Excuse us. Let us go take care of this because we do not need to have a pandemic. We do not need to go and put things over our faces because just like John G. Lake, the coronavirus, it will die in my hand because I know who my God is and I know what my authority is. Sorry. <laughs> no, I I was when you were saying that, it reminded me of a good friend by the name of Chad McDonald, and he is he's a true evangelist. And um he was sharing something the other day and it, it really spoke volumes to me. And he said, I'm really concerned about the church. And I said, why is that? And he said, more than anything, what he sees is all that this pandemic has really revealed about the church is everything that they were doing on the platform. They just done it on social media, That's right. but the church itself is not active. Mm-hmm. They're not laying on hands. They're not praying Uh with the sick they're not feeding the hungry they're not you know they're not doing all these things and it really kind of caught my attention and i went well i've not really thought about that because what they've done a lot of churches not all not all but a lot um what they've done is they just took what they were doing on the platform on sunday and they put it on zoom social media facebook whatever and they implemented it and they said hey we're having church and really what they were doing was just sharing a word. They weren't really being the church. That's right. Now, granted, 
a lot of people's going to say, well, what could we do? Because we were in a lockdown and so on and so forth. And, you know, I, I kind of think, you know, what would you really do? And, and, and this is me again, I'm admitting I'm not a pastor of a church, so I'm not putting myself in a higher position than a pastor or an apostle, whoever is leading the congregation. I don't want to come across that way at all. That is not my intention. It's just caused me to think about some things and caused me to question my own walk with God in the sense, what am I doing? Because no one wants to hear me say this, but this is a reality. If YouTube is censoring videos of doctors, I'm telling you the next lockdown you're going to have churches that are going to be censored on YouTube and Facebook and so on and so forth. Yep. So what are you going to do then church? What are you going to do then? We just going to, you know, lock it, hit the streets. Come on. I I mean, that's just just the reality of it. So we really have to go back and look at the scripture. You know, Mm -hmm. I, I saw in the beginning of this, everybody said, Oh, now we're really becoming an ax church because it moved to the home. You totally missed the point mm-hmm. because the Ash Church met for prayer and breaking of b- bread, but they got out of the home and went and multiplied the church yep. and they discipled individuals. Yep. That's right. So an Ash Church is not we just go to the home and we hunker down. An yep. Ash Church is an activated church. Come on. Come on. And that's the okay. So there you go. When you talk about the activation, right there is that it that is a verb that means move like today okay so today i did a little facebook live i haven't done a facebook live pretty much the whole lockdown i don't know i just didn't feel it so i'm I'm starting to do them again and so i said to the lord i said well all right i'm gonna do facebook live but what do you want me to talk about and i heard the song moving out by billy joel so i heard the song move it out and i was like okay what does it mean it's he goes it's time to start moving out it's no, we're, we're done being shut in. Now it's time to move out. And the Lord said to me, cause I was going for a walk and uh, he said, I want you to ask people if they need prayer. And so when we got, and I said this to my friend, I said, okay, I think we might be having to ask people now there's social distancing and all these like things, but pfft, on that, anyway, I, I mean, I'm being, res- I'm being respectful. Please, please hear my heart. Okay. But I also understand that that I would, that God's not going to put me in, into a position that is going to be um, detrimental to a person. We'll put it that way. So the first person we, we see he's fishing. Okay. And, and doesn't have a mask on. So ha- glory, hallelujah. I can see a smile. So we started to talk and he's fishing and uh, he says, well, you can pray for my fish. I said, Oh Lord, we just call forth the fish. And, and so my friend says, see, And so we did, we started to pray for the fishermen to catch fish because you know what? There is something about that. As we can go about our business, we can still do things. And as we go into different stores and we're doing our shopping, we could be praying under our breath. Well, actually we could be praying out loud because now they don't see your lips moving, but you could be praying in your spiritual language and you could be changing the atmosphere every place you go. We have to start changing the atmosphere. We have to start moving things. It, it's it, We're done with this lockdown and we also need to be praying for our president. Whether you like him or not, he is still in charge and he is the above authority. I mean, look at it. it the King, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, Let's just go there for one second. David prayed for him. David prayed for him and he was able to get things to shift. And he was even able to see, had King Nebuchadnezzar believe in the God that that Daniel believed in. So, you know, if you don't like who is in Congress, you don't like who's in your Senate, you don't like who your governor is or your mayor is, start praying for them. Start praying for them to have encounters. Start praying for their for their faith to rise up. Start praying for, for God to, to, you know, find them as they're sleeping. That You know, we have more power than we like to give, you know, give credit to. And like you kept saying, Ryan, I can't speak for other nations. Well, I can tell you this. Other nations have people who get risen from the dead. How many in in, in uh, the United States? I'm just saying, how many people said, well, I have such great faith. I'm going to go and pray for the people who died of coronavirus and we're going to watch them rise up. Nobody. Just saying. 
Not one per I haven't heard one pastor, one preacher who said, I'm going to go and raise up those coronavirus uh, people who, who passed away from coronavirus. And I'm not, this is not judgment against people. This is, this is a judgment against our church, against the body, because it says you shall raise the dead. And I am telling you that is coming. That is coming as we increase our faith. As your book was released, this is going to help people to start to see miracles. This is going to help people to start contending for the promises. Because you know what? The enemy has played us like a fiddle too. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, let's let's just play a couple more songs. Let's just play a couple more songs. Let's just, you know, okay, only, only three songs, five songs, you know, and then we're going to go into this. Who the heck's running the meeting? Uh-uh. It's like, no, this is God's house. You've turned my house into a den of thieves. And I think it's time for us to start bringing it back to a place of being holy. Sorry. Absolutely. <laughs> no, uh, one of my best friends in this world just the other day made this statement, Jason Armstrong. He, he made the statement. He said, before there ever is a great awakening, there's a rude awakening. Oh! <laughs> and oh! he said... He said, people would say, well, that don't sound like my Jesus. He said, yeah, they said the same thing before he flipped the tables. Come on. Come on. <laughs> that, you know, and you know what? Let, let's even go back to what you said, Ryan, because what you said, we believe, <laughs> we believe in, Je in, in baby Jesus. <laughs> we believe in crucifixion Jesus. But we sometimes forget that part that walked through where he, where he called people out on their stuff. He didn't call out the sinners because they already were consumed with their own guilt and stuff. He called out those who should have known better. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you, you say that I'll share this. I, I know we've been on here long, but I, I, I'll, I'll share this. I, I'm not an old man by no stretch of the imagination, but I'm not necessarily a young whippersnapper as they used to be. Um, I got some miles on me and some gray definitely coming through, but I, I was saying that I feel like I'm turning into the old man screaming, get off my lawn. Come on. Uh, <laughs> and in that process, I, I would find myself just busting out weeping at the same time. And I, I thought, Oh man, I am, I'm having a mental breakdown or something. You know, I'm frustrated one moment and the next morning I'm, I'm, I'm bawling my eyes out. And the Lord spoke to me one day and said, you know, when Jesus drove the people out of the temple with a whip and, a, and a, overturned the tables, he said, where was that? And I said, Jerusalem. And he goes, who did he weep for? And I went, Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And the Lord spoke this to me and said, I'm going to teach you how to weep for the same ones that frustrate you. Oh, that's so good. And what I recognize is this. It's not that the weeping is a, oh, I just have compassion for them and I'm saddened by their state of affairs. We totally miss that point. The compassion part of it is, I'm, I have so much compassion that I'm actually willing to do something about it. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of Jesus is compassion. The scripture says when he was moved by compassion, he didn't just go, oh, mm. he was moved and he did something. Come on. My concern for the church is we have lost our compassion mm -hmm. to actually do something. Come on. And you cannot find that compassion without a first love. Mm -hmm. That's so good. And I love that because really you can't pray for what you don't love. You don't have the same tenacity. You don't have that. Like you were like a pit bull, Ryan, with your mom because you love your mama. You loved your mama. You would have gone anywhere. You would have gone down to the pits of hell for your mama because you love her. Well, that is how Jesus loves the church. That is how Jesus loves his bride. He loves his bride. And that and so it, it I I have such a frustration because 
there is there's such a love and there's been such a grace that God has given us but it's now it's time to for those who God has given his sheep to i cry I literally cry for pastors who have been taking care of their sheep it breaks my heart that the, that they that they don't know, they don't know how much God loves them. How could you not teach your, your congregation how much you're loved? You know, you or or that it's okay to go about doing whatever you choose to do, and that you you're not seeing him as holy, that you don't see him as a father, that you don't see him as a provider that we're so quick to go to the doctor, but we don't go to the great physician because he is our healer. So we're so, you know, and these are things that, you know, our, our pastors and, uh, and those in leadership should be grooming and training. You train up a child in the way that they go and when they grow up, they will not depart. And it's just, we've been given this, I wanna say that we've been given this Fruit Loop cereal that doesn't have any, it just gets us hyped up on sugar and excited. And we were running around like crazy people, but we're not understanding that the breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Think about it. Like our Sundays, Sundays is, that should be our breakfast. And it should be a big buffet filled with eggs and protein. And it should have nutrients that are gonna sustain us for the rest of the day. But, but because they give us sugar, everybody gets all excited. And what happens? As soon as they walk out the door, the sugar rush is gone and they're back to where they were. And that's, that, true. And that's why your next, are you working on the next book? Because I'm just hearing your next book. <laughs> yeah, actually okay. three. <laughs> okay. Because I'm saying your next book is dealing, it's really dealing with the um, war of the raising up. That's what I'm, is that, is that the book, one of the books you're working on? Because I'm seeing like you're writing a book about how to raise up, how to really raise up a body of believers to walk out and to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And, and I think that that's the next phase. You know, we're, we're, we're going through these different phases. You know, we, we've been in this lockdown. And so we've gone through our sadness. We, and it's almost like grief, you know, mourning. And we should, we should mourn that the church is gone. But then after their, after their acceptance, because I really felt like the Lord's been talking to me about, you know, it's time to, to shut the, the church doors and it's time to hit the streets. It's time to rise up as the bride. And it's time to take back what has been stolen. And it's time to go out and find those who are lost. And it's time to proclaim the good news because it is good news. And I really believe that your book and your podcast, and if you guys haven't, um, let's see, I'm just going to put this up too, that, um, that Ryan has a uh, podcast called The Blacksmith Chronicles. So you can also find that on, uh, uh, it's uh, Destiny, right? Yeah, I just actually joined um, their podcast platform, Destiny Image, mm -hmm. uh, but you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, um, so you can check those out. I put out a podcast every single Thursday, Okay. and I also now uh, do a video version of that as well, so that the video edition is on YouTube, uh, whereas the, of course, the podcast, however you listen to it, it it's on those platforms as well. Well, and that's that's where you're going to get some some good meat. I'm just saying that if you follow if you follow Ryan Johnson, you're going to get fed very well between his books, between his podcast, between his heart. You're going to get fed because this next this next time frame that we're coming into it's it's about really training up warriors, and there is a warrior inside each and every person who's listening. And I really believe that just like with the blacksmith, you know, it's the iron sharpening iron. It's the hammering out what needs to be hammered. It's about putting it in and getting thing, that that uh, piece of metal, you know, piping hot so it can bend and mold into the shape that it needs to be. That's why everything that you do, Ryan, it's about it's about just shaping and molding and getting people ready to, you know, what a blacksmith does is they put shoes on horses, right? And so, and it's, it's, it's getting them ready for the running. 
you're going to get people ready for the running. Just like with con uh, how to contend for a miracle, it's getting them ready for the running, the running of their faith, the Blacksmith Chronicles, to get them ready to run their race and to run it well. Yes, that's what I feel. So, um, but I am sorry that we went so so long. I got I got a little I got a little excited. Sorry. <laughs> No, it's been great for me. I appreciate it very much. <laughs> Absolutely. So if people uh, want to get in touch with you, what we're going to do is we're going to put it's uh, ryanjohnson.usa. And so we're going to go ahead and we're going to pop that up. And that way, if people would like to get in touch with you, they can get in touch with you. Um, is there anything else that you want to say before we uh, end the broadcast? I sincerely appreciate it. It means a lot to me that you allowed me to be a part of this. Uh, I love to be able to share, of course, the story of my mother to give um, encouragement to other people, but to, to go so much further. I, I believe in challenging the body of Christ. Come on. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if we truly ever believe. I don't know if we know what we believe until we're challenged in our beliefs. So I love to be challenged. I love to challenge individuals. Uh, it's the only way that we grow. It's the only way we stretch. But it's how we become better, and therefore we do better. Oh, that's so good. And that's such a – that's that's a good papa's heart because you always want your kids to do better than you do. And that's, that's beautiful. So if you guys you. can, you definitely want to go out and get your copy. I am telling you. Get it for people who need to increase their faith. If somebody's going through a difficult time, especially through healing, or if they're, they have something that they haven't been able to overcome, mm -hmm. we need to start increasing people's faith because it's our faith that's going to bring us to the next place. We're going to see the signs and wonders and miracles, but the first place we have to go for is we have to build up our faith because our faith will move those mountains. Heck yes. yeah. So thank you guys so much. Thank you for tuning in. We had some fun. I told you it was going to be a faith-filled fun Tuesday on uh, Touch by Prayer. But thank you guys so much. You want to check out Ryan Johnson's podcast. It's called The Blacksmith Chronicles. You can go to ryanjohnson.us. You can also check out, he has two other books. You can check out his books there. But thank you guys for tuning in. Be blessed. Go out. Make a difference. You have something inside of you that this world needs. Remember, go out and touch someone. God bless and good night. Thank you for listening to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. It is our prayer that this episode challenged you, encouraged you, and equipped you for the advancement of the kingdom of God. For more episodes or ways that you can partner with Ryan Johnson Ministries, please go to www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Please join us again soon for another episode of the Blacksmith Chronicles.